Welcome to the second episode of Ask the Expert. My name is Christopher and with me today I have Stephen. And Stephen is one of our senior acoustic engineers and that's one great job title you have there, Stephen. Thank you. Can you tell me a little bit about what you do here at Dynaudio? I've just finished the, our new personal reference monitor, LYD, and my job is to kind of pull everything together and deliver a great sounding product. Perfect. Should we move on to the first question? Let's. Okay, Stephen, we have this really interesting question from Sasha, who asks if it's actually possible to fix a monitor problem using EQ and RTA. In short, no, you can't. You're trying to solve a time domain problem in the frequency domain, which is near enough impossible. You can use a pink noise source played through your speakers and an RTA to look at uh, peaks that are in your frequency domain and you can apply an EQ to reduce those peaks, but you're never going to solve a time domain problem. Okay, you talk about reducing, this. Should, I, should people boost if there's a dip? No, you should never boost. If there is a dip there, even though you're putting loads of energy in with pink noise, even if you put more energy in, there's still going to be a dip, and all you're going to do is break your speakers. Okay, so to sum up? To sum up, you can't truly solve a time domain problem in the frequency domain. Perfect. Okay, Stephen. We have a question from Mix, and he asks, is there a reason why the uh, image on a pair of BM5 Mark IIs are so good? Is it because it's smaller speakers? Yeah. What we tend to find is that smaller speakers image better than larger ones because they have a smaller baffle and the drive units are closer together. So the interactions between them happen at a higher frequency. So hopefully out of the audio band. Okay. And I know you mentioned something about artifacts to me earlier. Yep. Can you explain what those are and how they interact with, uh, yeah. with this image? So those, the artifacts that we get are um, edge diffraction and the actual interaction between the drive units themselves. Um, with edges, what tends to happen is the edge becomes another source. Um, and that source then interacts with the original source, which is the drive unit, and that causes uh, distortion and time smearing. And the time smearing and the distortion are the artifacts that cause the, the stereo image to collapse. And so a smaller speaker image is better. Okay, thanks. We have another question from Seamus, and he asks, Stephen, how do you feel about a mono reference for the engineer instead of a stereo? For me, if your stereo setup is good enough, you don't need a, a mono speaker. Okay. And that's just that simple? Yeah. If you've got a good pair of speakers and you've got a good interface that's capable of giving you a mono fold down, then you get a, a mono image that's the same as if it was coming from the left speaker or the right speaker. Okay, so could you actually use this for as a test for the quality of speakers? Yeah, we use it in R&D to, to test the quality of the speakers, how well they image, um, just to make sure that the image when it's mono is the same as if it was in the left or the right speaker. Okay, Stephen, we have this uh, really interesting question from Roloff. Mm -hmm. uh, that leads into room treatment and he asks about can you use 20 centimeters of rock wool as uh, a bass trap? You could but you'd have to put it in the middle of the room and I mean literally in the middle of the room. That would make it a bit inconvenient. It would. Um, as a traditional bass trap putting it against the wall it, it's not going to work. It needs uh, air movement through it to, to absorb. If you want to put an absorber against the wall, it's going to have to be a panel absorber or a tuned absorber. Um, and there's lots of designs on the web that you can go and find that are easy to build and design and get a nice base trap. Okay. And talking about room treatment, we have a question from Philip who asks, how would you go about treating a very small room? The problem with small rooms is they're small um, and if you're going to meet the ITU specification the amount of treatment you would have to put in would make the room unusable. So you have to be careful 
what to choose to treat. Um, there's going to be some base problems. You can try building some base traps. You'll have some flutter echoes from the walls. So maybe have a look at some diffusion on the side walls. But the trick is to make your room usable. You've got to remember it's a tool that you're using for mixing. And if you know your tool well, even with all its flaws, you can still do a good mix that will translate somewhere else. Okay. And you mentioned something about diffusion. And I remember an interview the two of us did previously. You, yep. you mentioned something quite interesting. Yeah, you can use um, a bookcase as a diffuser. Um, if you ir irregularly space the books, you can use them to diffuse the sound. If you want to be really picky, you can go and look up a quadratic diffuser and you can actually work out how deep the books need to be, how far apart they need to be, and it will work as a diffuser. Another thing you can do, if you've got space, is put a fabric-covered sofa in the middle of the room. Just like we talked about the rock wall, it will absorb the, the, the frequencies as an absorber in the middle of the room. And it works quite well as well. That's two pretty good tips right there. Can you try uh, and sum it all up? Yeah, you've got to be careful in a small room. The temptation is to over-treat, and then you end up with a room that is unusable or it's going to fatigue you. You can't spend more than half an hour in there without going crazy. So just be careful what you do and keep it to a minimum. Perfect, Stephen. Stephen, we've got a couple of questions from uh, Rob and Simon and Julian, and they're all asking about speaker listening uh, positions. Uh, more precisely, they're actually asking about the equilateral triangle. Can you try and explain that? Yeah, um, near field speakers are, are designed to be used in the equilateral triangle to get the best stereo image. That means that the distance between the speakers should be the same as the distance between the listener and the speaker. And typically, near-field monitors are designed to be used between arm's length and up to about two meters away. So that's it? That's it. That's pretty simple. Yep. Could you try and talk a little bit about the height of the setup? Yeah, that's a little bit more involved. Um, what happens is you've got your monitors on the desk and you get a reflection off the desk which interferes with the direct sound. The higher up you can get the speakers off the desk, the lower in frequency that interference happens. But it's something you'll just have to play with and see which one you prefer. So just try it out. Just try it out. That's it. Okay, Stephen, we have this really interesting question from Don, and he actually provided us with a graph for you to look at. Yep. And Don's problem is that he has treated his room with a lot of uh, diffusion and trapping, but he still has this huge null right in, the, in his mixing position. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on that? Yeah, from your graph, Don, it looks to me that you've got a desk reflection problem. That, that null is typical what I would expect from, from your desk. You can try integrating a subwoofer. I would suggest a higher cutoff frequency. Um, maybe move it around a bit, but I'd also try moving the speakers up and down to see if that helps resolve that problem. Cool. And we're actually going to talk a little bit about speaker, uh, subwoofer speaker placement right now, actually. Yep. Stephen, our last two questions are about a topic I know you're really passionate about, and that's subwoofers. Uh, the questions are from Jeremy and Jen, and they ask how they should go about setting up subwoofer speakers in the right way yeah well we should talk about satellite subwoofer integration as well as subwoofer placement so ideally the subwoofer should be equidistant to the listener as the main speakers so if you imagine a sphere around the listener's head the subwoofer needs to be on the same sphere as the main speakers once you've done that using our app you can generate pink noise use the RTA. So if you put the pink noise through all your speakers, you can look at the RTA. With the subwoofer out of phase, you adjust the crossover until you see a strong null. When you have a strong null, put the subwoofer back in phase. Hopefully everything is nice and smooth, and then you're good to go. And then you're good to go. That's it. And the air is the Dynaudio sound meter, right? Yep. Perfect. Thanks for all the question, guys. That was all we had time for today. 
I want to thank you, Stephen, for taking time out of your busy calendar to come help us out. It's a pleasure. Remember, guys, to subscribe to our YouTube channel where you will get all the latest Ask the Expert videos. See you next time.